All right, welcome to our unit on thermochemistry. Today's topic is specific heat and calorimetry. Lesson one of three, your objectives are as follows. Okay, to understand specific heat and the units for specific heat. Okay, to understand calorimetry in the equation Q is equal to M, okay, CP, delta T. And to understand heat flow with regard to endo and exothermic changes to a system and its surroundings and to understand the first law of thermodynamics. For your quick write, in one to two sentences, answer one of the questions below here. Okay, How do you think heat travels from your body to the surroundings? What do you think holds heat better, water or a metal such as iron? And finally, why do you think we use some substances like metal to cook our food and other substances like water to cool our engines? Okay, go ahead and pause this while you're doing your quick write. I want to move on. Okay, so heat transfer in specific heat. If you recall, heat is the energy that is transferred between objects that have different temperatures. Okay, but heat, what it really is, it's kinetic energy that is always transferred from an object with a higher temperature to an object with a lower temperature. So when you're measuring temperature, what you're really measuring is how fast the atoms or molecules are vibrating or moving. Okay, so that's what you're really measuring, the kinetic energy of atoms or molecules, how fast or slow they're moving. So temperature, like I said, is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules. Okay, specific heat. Specific heat, well, if we define it, is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Okay? So, we represent specific heat with a symbol, C subscript P. All right? It is a constant for a given substance at a certain pressure. So, it is a constant, which means, say, for aluminum or iron, it is a value like density. Okay? So, the units of specific heat are joules divided by grams in degrees Celsius. Okay, joule, J, is the SI unit of energy. Okay, so it is a measurement of energy, the joule. G is the mass in grams of a substance, and C, well, that's just degrees Celsius. So think of specific heat as a substance or a chemical's ability to hold and retain heat. Substances with a high specific heat act like a heat sponge, and they're really well at holding a lot of heat. In other words, they can absorb a lot of heat with just a small change in temperature. So, for your notes, what is specific heat? Okay, go ahead and pause this while you write. I'm going to move on. Okay, so calorimetry. Calorimetry is the measure of heat transfer. So suppose a chemist wants to calculate the amount of heat transferred when the temperature of a sample or a substance changes by so many degrees. In other words, how much heat was lost or gained by a substance. So the amount of heat absorbed or released by a substance or sample is symbolized by the letter Q here. Okay? So Q represents the amount of heat transferred, lost or gained by a substance. It is calculated using the following equation. Q is equal to the mass of a substance, the substance specific heat, okay, and the change in temperature here. Okay? So let me summarize that again. Alright? So here's our equation. So Q is the symbol for heat transfer. If Q is positive, okay, heat is absorbed by the system and the reaction is endothermic. Heat is absorbed. If Q is negative though, heat is lost by the system and the reaction is exothermic. Okay, So M, well that's just how much the sample weighs, the mass of the sample in grams. Okay, C is the specific heat of a substance, this is a constant. Okay, And delta T is the change in temperature, the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Okay. So, for your notes, what is calorimetry? Go ahead and pause this while you write. I want to move on.
Okay, so system and surroundings. When considering heat flow, scientists call the object being studied the system. And everything around the system is defined as, well, the surroundings. So let's say this block of ice represents the system on a hot summer day. Everything around the ice, the warm air in this case, is considered the surroundings. Okay, so think about what's hot and what's cold in this example. And remember, heat always moves from hot to cold. So how do you think heat is going to move when you consider our system and its associated surroundings, okay? So think about the scenario going on here. In this case, heat is going to go into our system, or the block of ice, and heat is absorbed from the surroundings. Okay, and you could probably imagine what the block of ice is going to do if it's absorbing heat. Okay, so when heat travels or flows into our system, heat is absorbed. So the change is endothermic, okay, and is positive. So because the ice was gaining heat or it absorbed heat, Q, heat flow, was positive. Okay, so in the case of ice melting, Q is positive, ice melting into water. When heat travels or flows out of the system, heat is released, so the change is exothermic, or negative here. So when, let's say, water freezes, okay, instead of melts, in, this, in the example I just used, Q is actually negative, okay? Okay, so for your notes, when considering heat flow, Q, what is the difference between the system and the surroundings? Okay, go ahead and pause this while you write. I'm going to move on. Okay, so thermodynamics. The study of energy is called, well, thermodynamics. The law of conservation of energy is often called the first law of thermodynamics and is stated as follows. Okay, well, it's pretty basic. The energy in the universe is constant. Okay, it does not change. It can go from different forms of energy, but the diff the, all the energy in the universe is constant. Okay. All right, so that's it. So for your notes, what is the first law of thermodynamics? Okay, go ahead and pause this while you write. I'm gonna move on. Okay, so practice. Try doing a problem on your own here. When you're ready to check your work, hit play. Okay, let's see how you did. So what amount of heat is needed to increase the temperature of 2,006 grams of mercury by 7.5 degrees Celsius? The specific heat of mercury is 0.139 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So in other words, how much heat do we need to add to mercury, to 2,006 grams of mercury, to raise its temperature by 7.5 degrees Celsius? Okay, so how much heat do we need to add here? Well, well, let's start thinking about what we know here. Okay, we, we know our equation. We know the specific heat of mercury, okay, which is a constant for a substance. This number for mercury will never change. Okay, um, we want to raise the temperature by 7.5 degrees Celsius, 7.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, and the mass of the substance of mercury is 2006 grams. Okay, so solving for Q, okay, we need to add 2091 joules of energy into our sample of mercury to raise its temperature by seven and a half degrees. Okay, hopefully you got that right. Okay, next problem. Once again, try to do this on your own, and when you're ready to check your work, okay, go ahead and hit play. Okay, so how much heat is required to raise the temperature of 150 grams of water from 35 degrees Celsius? We want to raise it up to 75 degrees Celsius, so a change in temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, okay? And we have the specific heat of water right here. Okay, so once again, let's use our equation and start considering what we know here. Well, 
we know we have 150 grams of water. Okay, the specific heat of water is always going to be 4.184. Okay, that will never change. All right, and we know we want to raise it to 75 degrees Celsius. That's the final temperature, and it started at 35 degrees Celsius. Okay, solving for Q, we get 25,104 joules of energy is needed. Okay to raise 150 grams of water from 35 degrees Celsius to 75 degrees Celsius. And this is a high specific heat. One thing to note, worth noting, water has a high specific heat. In other words, it takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water. Okay, hopefully you got that right. All right, so a lab scenario here. We're gonna be doing something very similar to this in one of our labs in class, so try to follow along. Consider the following situation here. So let's say you have a 50 gram sample of iron at 100 degrees Celsius. It's hot. Okay, so we have this hot piece of metal. This is our system. And then we had this, okay, glass of water here that contains 100 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius. So it's cooler. So we have a hot piece of metal and a cooler sample of water. Then we're going to drop this piece of hot metal, our system, into its surroundings. Okay, so we drop this hot piece of metal into some cooler water. How is heat transferred from the system to the surroundings? Okay, well think about this. Notice the temperature here. The temperature goes up of the thermometer of the water. So notice the temperature of the water went up. So in this case, heat flows from the hot piece of metal to the cooler surrounding water. Okay. So in this case, Q of the metal is negative because the metal lost heat. Well, that heat had to go somewhere, right? Into the surroundings. So Q of the water is positive because it gained heat from the metal. So this is very important. According to the first law of thermodynamics, the heat lost by the metal must be equal to the heat gained by the water. Okay, so Q of the water, the heat of the water was equal to the heat lost by the metal. Well, we know Q is also equal to this equation we just learned, right? So, we can set these equal to each other. We have the mass of the water multiplied by the specific heat of water multiplied by the change in temperature of the water is equal to the mass of the metal multiplied by the specific heat of the metal multiplied by the change in temperature of the metal. Okay? So, this is an important equation. We will be using this in a lab and for a practice problem here. Okay, so here's a good practice problem. It's going to be just like one of the problems you do in a lab. Okay, so consider the following scenario, just like the last situation I talked about. We have a 50 gram sample of iron. It's hot. It's at 100 degrees Celsius. We drop it into cooler water here, 100 grams of water. That's at a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius. The final temperature of the mixture is 25 degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat of iron? Okay, so we have the specific heat of water is given. Notice. So remember, the heat lost by the metal is equal to the heat gained by the water. In other words, Q of the metal is equal to the Q of water. Okay, so we have this big long equation here. We have to start filling in what we know. All right, so we know the mass of the water, which is 100 grams. All right, we know the specific heat of water given up here. And we know the change in temperature of the water. The final temperature was 25 degrees Celsius, and the initial temperature was 21 degrees Celsius, which gives us a temperature change of 4 degrees Celsius. Okay, now let's solve for the metal here. For the mass of the metal, we know the metal weighed 50 grams. The specific heat of the metal is what we're solving for. And the change in temperature of the metal, well, its final temperature was 25 degrees Celsius minus, okay, 100 degrees Celsius. So the metal changed a lot in temperature, negative 75 degrees Celsius. All right. Now we can simply substitute these values into our equation. Okay, so we have the mass of water. 
we have the specific heat of water and we have the change in temperature of the water okay it went up four degrees now for the metal well we know the metal weighed 50 grams okay we're solving for the specific heat here and the change in temperature is negative 75 it lost heat so solving for the specific heat of metal we get 0.446 joules per grams degrees Celsius which is a right because metals have low specific heats okay all right hopefully you're able to follow along with that go ahead and summarize you can always write your own okay so make sure you complete your summary for 20 easy points and we'll see you next time